Hello, welcome to Chatomics. This is Tommy again. Today I'm going to show you how to make heat map in R using this package uh, called Complex Heat Map. Uh, in this video, I'm going to also show you how to understand heat map uh, in a deeper way. So, Complex Heat Map is the I would say the best uh, heat map making R package out there. So I highly recommend you read the tutorials uh, from this package's author. So first let's uh, load this uh, library. And then let's make some dummy data. Okay. Let's look how the matrix look like. So we just made a dummy data. So essentially we have uh, four genes here, H1, H2, L1, L2, and we have eight time points. Okay, let's first visualize the data to see how it looks like. And in this panel, you will see how it looks like for those four genes, H1, H2, L1, L2. So H stands, stands for high, L stands for low. So you will see here, those are two low genes, those are two high genes. And you see, actually, this gene has the same, same pattern with this gene across time points. And this gene, the black one, and this uh, green one has the same pattern. Okay, and making a heat map is very easy. So after you load complex uh, uh, heat map, so this function heat map, note that you should uh, make it capital H, and then you just feed the matrix, which is here. And you can, there are multiple arguments that you can put there. So we can say cluster rows equals to true or false. So by default, both are true. So now we set the cluster columns to false because those are time points. So we don't want to cluster them. But you know, we will cluster the genes. So let's see how it looks like. Okay. This is the uh, heat map. So you will see, so first for a heat map, essentially each grade represents one value and heat map essentially just use color to represent value, right? And you see those L1, L2, those are like lower genes, like they have small values. And you, if you look at the legend here, so those blue ones are, uh, of low levels and those red ones and also the maybe the white ones those are high values so from 10 to 20 okay actually making a heat map is really easy but note that because the scale uh, the uh, scale of those data is quite different so 1 to 3 and then 10 to 20 and, and we can change the color mapping by using some functions in circleize the other package. For example, you can map 0 to blue, 3 to white, and 20 to red. And let's remake this heat map and see how it looks like. So by the way, by default, uh, I will actually ex uh, extrapolate the color from 0, the smallest number, uh, actually 1, the smallest number, to the highest number and uh, extrapolate uh, from blue to uh, to red evenly. But let's but we can change that color mapping. So now we map zero to blue, three to white, and twenty to red. So let's see how it looks like. See now exactly if you look at the uh, the key. The legend here, zero will be uh, blue, and three will be white. So three, those values, they will be white. And you see, 
20 will be red, the, the, red, the most red. Okay, so why color mapping is so important? Because there could be some like outliers. For example, let's change the first value of here into a thousand. Okay, we just make a new copy of uh, this matrix called mat2, and then we change the value, the first uh, entry here, 10 to a thousand. Okay, let's look at mat2 here. So now the first value becomes 1,000. Okay, let's make a heat map, but without specifying the color mapping. What do you see here? Because by default, it, um, uh, it is extrapolating the colors from the smallest one to the highest, uh, to the biggest, 1,000. So the the uh, thousand will be like really red, but the red, the rest of them they are all like blue. So to actually uh, counter this like outlier effect, you can specify this color mapping. So essentially, we use the same color mapping function like here. So anything above twenty, they will be red. So let's try it again after we specify the color mapping. Now we we get this more like um, more useful visualization of the heat map because the first first value here although it's a thousand but it's just red here and it's not going to skew uh, all the colors for other uh, values in this heat map. Okay. So what uh, we usually do, for example, uh, for a gene expression data matrix, we always want to scale across the rows, essentially for the same gene across all the time points or across all the samples. So in R, you can do uh, use the scale function, but scale works on columns, so you want to first transpose this matrix using T. After you scale it, then you transpose it back. So let's see how it looks like after you scale the matrix. And now the scaled matrix becomes this, and then it, now it's become, um, the data range becomes minus one to, to one. Okay, let's look at how it looks like if, if we uh, plot the heat map. So we, again, we specify class columns force, but uh, the rows will be clustered by default. See, so again, it, it this is what we expected. Like, see those uh, uh, because data value now is, uh, for the whole data matrix ranges from minus one to one, and uh, the red will be one, and the blue will be like minus one, for example, and exactly match here. But if you compare this heat map versus the old heat map that without scaling. There's something actually interesting because in this heat map we see L1 and H1 now they cluster together, right? But if you go back to the old matrix with uh, old heat map without scaling, let's look this one. H1 and H2 actually they're they're clustered uh, together. They're closer to each other, and L1 and L2 they are closer to each other. So what's happening here? So we really need to, uh, in order to understand heat map, you really need to understand the clustering, right? So, so in order to cluster uh, different rows or different columns together, you first have to define the distance between the rows or the columns. So in R, there's a function called dist. Uh, uh, it's used to calculate the distance between the rows. So if you just question mark and this, you will see the help from here. So this function actually computes and returns the distance matrix uh, uh, between the rows of a data matrix. For example, if we do this and supply um, mat as the argument, then we'll calculate distance 
and we'll look at so so now you see the distance essentially okay this is more like a pairwise distance uh, this gene and versus this gene what's the distance h2 and l1 what's the distance so this is pairwise and by default the method is called euclidean distance and just note there are multiple different distances like euclidean maxim manhattan uh, binary all different distances and they are they, they are used in different scenarios and Euclidean distance is the, the, the most easiest. For example, in the 2D space, you have uh, two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2. And the Euclidean distance is essentially just x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus, minus y2 squared and take the uh, square root. So that's the definition of Euclidean distance. So after you define the distance, so you want to do a clustering so what how do you do, do clustering so in R this um, function called edge clust so you can look at help so the input of edge clust is the distance um, that we just calculated using the dist function and again note that uh, to to do hierarchical clustering you can also use different method for example you can use or it's called different linkage. So you can use like word D, word D2, single, complete, and the average. So uh, different methods actually, uh, or different linkage, they have different criteria to actually aggregate the nearby clusters. So you want to actually Google around to see uh, which method you want to use. Okay, so let's do this, okay. Since we already calculate the distance between the genes, the rows, and then let's do a clustering and then we can plot the clustering. So what you see here, okay, I think by default because it's calculating the Euclidean distance, L1, L2, those are small genes, like genes with lower values, and H1, H2, those are genes with high values uh, or, or bigger values. So the Euclidean distance between them are closer to each other. So that's why H1 and H2 uh, are close, uh, are clustered together, and, uh, and L1 and L2 are clustered together. So now let's actually uh, scale the data. And the second heat map we use the scale data, and we we'll let's calculate the distance again using this this function. But now we use the scaled matrix, and let's plot the clustering. Again. And you will see now because after you scale it, now um, H1 and L1 actually comes together and H2 and L2 are comes together. So this is really corresponding to this heat map here. Scaled matrix, if you make a heat map, note that now H1 and L1 they are closer together and H2 and L2 they are closer to each other. So I hope it's not too confusing, but I will actually have uh, the link of this R markdown in the video description so you can follow this uh, R code and, and play with it by yourself to, to really deeply understand how heat map works and how actually clustering works. And in fact, if you look at the help of a heat map, for example, this function, you will see it's using by default the clustering is using the edge cluster function. Oh, so, okay, let me actually go back like here. So, for example, here, see cluster method rows, you no, know, it passed to edge cluster. And uh, you see, and then the distance rows, then it passes to dist. So you can always actually uh, specify uh, what kind of distance you want to use. So the key takeaway for today's uh, video is that color mapping is really critical, right? You, when you have an outlier, if you uh, don't pay attention of that, that color will skew all the values 
uh, in this heat map. And scaling is also critical. Whether you scale it or not, it will actually change the clustering results. So lastly, making a heat map is easy, but you better to understand the details. So I hope you enjoyed this video and see you next time.